The people who run your network get to choose how big each subnet is and how many subnets there are. In this video, we're going to go over the key terms and then talk about the math and then give you a chance to practice. Let's get into it. So in this video, it's related to chapter 13 of the current CCNA CERT guide, volume one. And in that particular chapter, we talk about masks. The first part talks about basic math to convert between formats. And in the second section, we talk about design choices and what you can learn about those choices from the mask. In this video, here's the outline. We'll talk about a term VLSM that has to do with using many masks in a network. We'll talk about this classless and classful addressing set of terms that are related. Then we'll get into the math and review that. You've seen it before. And then we'll do one variation on that where we inst instead of using a network to start with to subnet it, we'll start with a CIDR block. On that note of having seen the mask before, there's an earlier video associated with chapter 11 that talks about the same math. In this case, this one's associated with chapter 13. It's probably the most obvious overlap of topics in this entire part. So just be aware if you if you think, hey, haven't I seen this before recently? If you're following the course in order, yes, you have. But in this video, more depth and more about those associated terms. All right, so that's where we're headed. As usual, stick around to the end. I'll give you some advice. I've got a review exercise with you here at the channel and some tips about how to best use the equivalent content over in the book. All right, let's jump in. So let me define this term for you. VLSM, Variable Length Subnet Masks, it means using more than one mask in the subnets of one classful network. Now, classful network means class A, B, or C network. So your starting point, more often than not, is either a public class A, B, or C network or a private class A, B, or C network, any of those. If you make the design choice to use more than one subnet mask in the different subnets of one network, that's VLSM, all right? So some common misconceptions is, hey, using more than one mask inside your whole enterprise, that doesn't always mean VLSM, and I'll give you some examples. It also does not mean, hey, I'm using one mask and then dynamically the mask changes. It changes over time. That's not what the word variable means in this case. So it's not some way for the mask to change somehow. All it is is, hey, I'm creating subnets. Do I pick one mask only or do I use multiple different masks? If I use multiple inside the same classful network, it's VLSM. For instance, if I've got this class B network and I choose to use only one mask, slash 24, for instance, so all these subnets have a slash 24 mask, it's not using VLSM. Or if instead I had used a slash 23 mask only and made the subnets twice as big, but all of them were slash 23, not VLSM. And just to pound it home a little bit, if I had used slash 22 for the mask to make them even larger subnets, but that's the consistent mask for all subnets in the network. Again, that design would not use VLSM. So what is VLSM? Say inside this same class B network, I have a mix of slash 23 and slash 24 subnets. So these smaller blue ones, slash 24 masks, the larger orange ones, slash 23 masks. Now that might be exactly what you want. It's reasonable to do, lots of companies do it, all right? It's just a little more complex to operate, so that's your trade-off. But if you want to do that, great, go for it. That would be a case where you're using VLSM in network 172.16.0.0. And again, just to pound it home, here would be a case with three different masks. So it's, again, using VLSM because it's more than one mask. We've got some that are smaller with slash 24 masks, a couple with slash 23, and one with slash 22. Next, I want to talk about a couple of terms, classless addressing and classful addressing. So big warning here. The terms classless and classful are applied to routing and routing protocols, and those mean different things, all right? So here it's classless addressing, classful addressing, all right? So just terminology-wise, pay attention to that. So classless addressing is a description, or it means it's a description of how to think. So when you think about the structure of an IP address, 
classless addressing says I don't have to think about class A, B, or C. All right, so I can ignore class A, B, and C when I think about the structure. So it's a two-part structure that ignores class. So what are the two parts? The prefix, which is the part that's the same for every address in a subnet, the number that's consistent amongst all addresses in a subnet, and the host part that changes from address to address to address to identify different addresses. All right, so that's the idea. And it turns out that with a subnet mask, the prefix part, the mask is all binary ones, and in the host part, the mask is all binary zeros. All right, so that's the way to think with classless addressing thoughts, all right? The prefix and host part add up to 32 because IP version 4 addresses are 32 bits wide. Now, to contrast that, class full addressing says I must think about class rules, class A, B, and C rules. And as a result, I end up with three parts to the address structure. So again, the term class full addressing is a term that means this is a way to think about addresses. Now, it doesn't change the address. It doesn't change how the addresses work. It changes how we humans think about and talk about them. All right, so it's just a way to think. So when we think with classful addressing thoughts, we think, hey, there's a part here that's the network part, and it's 8, 16, or 24 bits wide based on whether the address itself is a class A, B, or C address per class rules. All right. Then there's still a host field that follows the same rules. It matches the bit positions where the mask in binary is zeros. And whatever is left over between them is this field called the subnet field, the subnet part of the address. So you can analyze an address or a network with the chosen mask and apply these class A, B, and C rules and figure out the size of the network, subnet, and host fields much like you could with classless addressing, but in this case with classful addressing, you end up with three fields, which together add up to 32. So if we compare these two ways to think, by the way, both ways to think are useful at different times. You use classful addressing when this matters, this distinction between these, and you ignore that and use classless addressing when the distinction doesn't. But if we add them together, it turns out the width of the prefix part is the same as the combined network and subnet part. So the prefix length equals network plus subnet bit length. All right, so it's the same width, if you will, for each of those. So you can do a little math to figure it out, but you use classless addressing when you, you don't really care about this particular detail. And we'll use both throughout our discussion of IP version 4 subnetting. All right, last thing, I'm going to sum up some math we're going to see leading up to the next topic here in this video. So if I look at a mask in prefix notation, like slash 20, slash 24, slash 26, whatever, so that's the mask in prefix notation, slash p. All right, we'll use the the variable p to represent that number. So p is the number of binary ones in the mask. For instance, slash 24 means the mask has 24 binary ones in it. So the number of host bits, it's the number of binary zeros in the mask. And you can calculate that based on this little equation, h equals 32 minus p, if p is the prefix length. For instance, if this is 24 over here, we've got eight host bits. If it's 16, we've got 16 host bits, and so on. Then, if you do know the number of prefix bits, i.e. you've been given slash 24 as the mask, you know that the number of prefix bits equals the sum of the network plus subnet bits. So that can help. And we also know that the number of network bits, all you got to do is figure out the class, and that tells you whether there are 8, 16, or 24 network bits, and it's some simple math to then figure out the number of subnet bits. By the way, when you are thinking about buying my books, any other books, or anything else for that matter, if you'll start with this QR code or my link tree and buy from there, you don't have to pay anything more, but those sellers will give me a small affiliate marketing credit. It's a great way to say thanks and support the channel. All right, let's get back to the content. All right, let's get into the specifics. If you think classfully and you're starting with a class A, B, or C network, and you're subnetting it, you can think, of course, as three separate parts of the address structure, a number of network, subnet, and host bits. We just talked about how to come up with those. 
And then you can do a calculation that says, hey, if I've got S subnet bits, then there are two to the S subnets in the design. And if there are H host bits, there are two to the H minus two usable addresses in the subnet. And this minus two is because in any subnet, the subnet ID and the subnet broadcast address are reserved and cannot be assigned to a host to be used as an address, all right? So you have to subtract those two out as reserved numbers. Now, there are some assumptions for that to work, and we'll talk about those in just a second. So we can think classfully, like the top diagram, or classlessly, and the classlessly helps us along the way a little bit, but you're going to need to think classfully to get the size of the subnet field to do that 2 to the S calculation, all right? So some of the rules summarized here. The number of network bits, they're always on the left, and it's 8, 16, or 24 of those, depending on whether you're subnetting a class A, B, or C network. So for this discussion right now, we're assuming we're subnetting a class A, B, or C network. Then if you're looking at the mask in prefix notation, like it's slash P, you know, slash 18, slash 21, whatever, the sum of the network and subnet bits equals that P. So if you know there's 16 network bits and you've got a slash 21 mask, then you know there's five subnet bits because 16 and 5 add up to 21, for instance. So you can find the size of the subnet field. The host field is whatever you'd have to add to P to get to 32, or mathematically 32 minus P will give you the number of host bits. Then you can do those calculations that I just mentioned to you. All right, so what are those assumptions? It's one class full network, that is one class A, B, or C network that you're subdividing, and you've chosen to use one subnet mask for all subnets and one alone. And we just learned a few minutes ago, that means you're not using VLSM. VLSM would mean you're using more than one subnet mask amongst those. And the rationale is, if you're using more than one mask, you don't know if the next subnet that gets allocated is a huge one and consumes lots of address space, or tiny and barely consumes any, leaving lots of space for more subnets. It's unpredictable. Whereas if you've made a policy decision that says one mask only, we can predict the number of subnets and what the subnet IDs are and do more planning with that. It makes it simpler, but you may prefer to use VLSM and you just can't predict the number of subnets in that case. Now, I'm going to show you three examples, a class A, B, and then C, but the earlier video associated with Chapter 11, uh, it has 10 examples, so if you really want some more examples, look to the card that's above my head here and click that, and you can get lots and lots of examples. So here's an idea. If you're subnetting some class A network and your one and only one mask is slash 22, Here's the analysis that gets you to the classful view of the size of the fields and then the calculations. So if it's class A, you've got eight network bits by definition. And if the one mass that's chosen is slash 22, then the size of the subnet field is 14 because eight plus 14 is 22. The host field, it's 32 minus the prefix bits. 32 minus 22 gives you 10. Also, network plus subnet plus host bits adds up to 32. So armed with that knowledge, 2 to the 14th gives us the number of subnets, and 2 to the 10th minus 2 gives us the number of hosts per subnet. Then with the class B example, if our one and only one mask is slash 26, we know we've got 16 network bits because it's a class B network that we're subnetting. Then with a the slash 26 mask, we know network plus subnet bits add up to 26, so that gives us 10 subnet bits. 16 plus 10 plus 6 more gives us 32, so that confirms we've got 6 host bits, or 32 minus the prefix length gives us 6 host bits as well. Then we do the math, 2 to the number of subnet bits, 2 to the tenth for the number of subnets, 2 to the number of host bits minus 2 gives us 62 hosts per subnet. One more example. How about a class C example with a slash 29 mask? Because it's class C, our network part is going to be 24 bits long. So we're subnetting some class C network. With this particular mask of slash 29, the network plus subnet part has got to add up to 29, making the subnet part 5 bits wide, leaving 3 bits for the host bits over here. And the usual math, 2 to the number of subnet bits to tell us how many subnets we'd create, 2 to the third in this case, minus 2 for 6 hosts per subnet. 
So far, the examples assumed you were subnetting a class A, B, or C network. But let's say you're subnetting a public CIDR block that's a large CIDR block and all your addresses are from that CIDR block. So you've got this big block size. Well, you may end up doing that. So what are your rules and how are they different? Well, when you get that block assignment from your regional registry or an ISP, they're going to give you a number that represents the, the block and it's going to be the lowest number in the block. And they're also going to give you what looks like a prefix length, like a slash 18 in this example. And if you do subnetting math on these numbers, you'd get a range of addresses and that defines your block. The addresses you've got to manipulate and subdivide and subnet to use as subnets and addresses in your network. All right. So given that, you want to treat this prefix length that's assigned in your CIDR block as n in the previous examples, as the number of network bits. So you'd use 18 instead of 8, 16, or 24 in our previous discussions. Then for the number of host bits, it's always at the end. It's the number of zeros in the mask. Then the subnet bits are still what's between the block bits in the left and the host bits on the right as usual. So just another look at that. If we think about the number of block bits per what you receive from the RIR, think of them on the left. So instead of network bits is 8, 16, or 24, think of this as the block size bits over here. The prefix that you use to subnet with then will be a larger number than the number given to you in that block. So if you were given a slash 18, maybe your subnet mask is a slash 25. All right. So the prefix bits that you choose to use in your subnet mask is going to be that assigned block size prefix length plus your number of subnet bits. So you'll have some subnet bits to count subnets with. Then the host bits is always 32 bits minus your subnet masks prefix length. So now we're back to the same old math here. So in effect, we're replacing the number of network bits with the block size bits that were part of your assignment of your CIDR block. All right, study group, where do we go from here? Well, we're talking about identifying what other people have done with the design by choosing these masks. This is the last time I'm hitting this topic specifically, so I would just suggest that you practice and become comfortable and make sure you understand and are confident coming up with the answers. The earlier chapter that I mentioned, it has additional practice, and I've got practice for you here. So there's a video that gives you six more practice problems like this, where it gives you a class of network and the one and only one mask that's used, and asks you, do the classful analysis and tell me how many subnets are created and how many hosts per subnet. So a little bit more practice there. And with the matching section in the book, instead of just rereading the content, which would be useful in this case, it's always good to have a second look. For instance, if you're a little fuzzy on those classless and classful addressing definitions, there's a different way that it's explained in the book, for instance. But there are more examples. There are practice problems at the end of the chapter, or at least it's uh, toward the end of the chapter with the answers at the very end of the chapter, and the companion website, the online practice that comes with the books. There's yet even more practice on these. It's probably way more practice than you actually need, but if you want more practice, you've got it. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you want the next one that's like this, click on the left. It'll get you to the first video in the next chapter, which zeroes in on what it means to be a subnet and the math related to that. If you want to get to those review questions for this content, click on the right and you'll get to those extra practice problems. Hey, thanks for spending the time. I'll talk to you soon.